start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Seki Vasquez, and uh, I'm presenting you this session, uh, Drupal Extreme Scaling. Uh, from the, for the next hour, uh, I will be uh, talking about a, a project that I, I had the pleasure to, to participate uh, about uh, one year to uh, us to, to make this project work. And, uh, well, uh, I will focus on the infrastructure on this project. This project was uh, successful. And well, I will give you the details under the, the project, uh, and I will focus on, on the scaling features of the project. When I start to, to talk about the project itself, you will see why uh, the session is titled Drupal Strain Scaling. Okay, so first things first, who's me? Who's this guy? Well, as I said, my name is Seki Vasquez, Ezekiel Seki Vasquez. I work as a DevOps, um, well, freelance mainly, and also I do backend uh, Drupal development. I focus uh, on Drupal science uh, for the last uh, three years and a half. I also am a PhD student on the University of Seville. My uh, PhD thesis uh, will talk about uh, cloud computing. Uh, to be precise, uh, I will try to develop a formal method to optimize uh, cloud deployment options. Well, um, also, I also uh, am very involved with uh, hacking and security, IT security stuff, really like it. And well, not uh, everything in life is uh, code, you know, <laughs> uh, all, there are other things. And I, will, I always like to uh, let you know, the public know, about some of my uh, hobbies. For example, I, I like rock and roll. I play the electric uh, guitar. I have my own uh, <laughs> rock band. I like uh, video games, and well, I love to, to read books too, special adventure books. And well, after this uh, introduction, I will uh, review uh, the points, uh, the main points, the main sections of the uh, session. Uh, first, I will give you a, a brief introduction of uh, why uh, scaling, why extreme scaling. Uh, after that, I will uh, describe the project, the requirements, and the technologies, and all the stuff. The main, the main points is, is the second. After that, I will focus on some problems we found uh, when developing the, the project and how, to, uh, how we solved those problems. Uh, after that, I will, I will show you a a little demo, it's recorded, <laughs> no more live demos. And finally, I will uh, share some conclusions very, very fast. So uh, let's start with this uh, introduction. Well, when we, th when we think about uh, Drupal scaling, scalability, performance, availability, uh, we all have some uh, modules and some techniques, some tools on mind uh, for example, uh, the ones that we have here, you know, Drupal, uh, Drupal has a, a problem with cache, with cache, sorry. Uh, it uh, uses by default uh, the database as, as cache uh, system, so we can use memcache. Uh, uh, Drupal is built on, on PHP, so we use APC or pcache. Uh, we uh, use varnish, you know, uh, to improve the the, run, uh, the the speed, sorry, of our of our application for anonymous users. Well, we use redundancy to uh, be sure, be confident about uh, availability, and well, you can choose whatever technique, whatever tool, modules. There's a lot of modules to improve uh, this kind of stuff, which are non-functional. Non uh, requirements. But uh, we have to consider new technologies that uh, come from the last years to nowadays and, well, they represent not the future but the present. And uh, I want to focus uh, in this introduction on two of them, the two main technologies that uh, we use it on this project. I'm talking about cloud computing and containers. Um, the main uh, advantage of cloud computing is the elastic computing. What does uh, this mean? Very simple. 
we have uh, resources. Uh, we, and sorry, we don't have resources fixed. I mean, uh, we don't have, for example, four servers, six servers, and then uh, we have uh, those resources in the same amount of, uh, of time. Sorry, I will uh, repeat. Okay, what I was talking about is Basically, we have a uh, fixed number of servers, but with co cloud computing, we have the ability to have an elastic amount of uh, resources. For example, when uh, our application has a workload, uh, a peak uh, on the workload, those resources are able to scale up. Uh, I mean, to, we, we will have more resources, more RAM, more CPU, etc., to be able to manage it that uh, peak. On the workload, and when we have no more need for those extra resources, those resources just uh, scale down and disappear. So we don't spend too much money on on this uh, on this stuff. In theory, all the cloud providers sell uh, this stuff as uh, well. We have uh, almost 100% uh, scalability and availability, and this is not true. Why? Uh, well. It's not the first time, or it, it will not be the first time that uh, one of the CPDs of, for example, Amazon Web Services goes down, uh, and one availability zone just disappears for a couple of hours, or you know. So you have to be very careful when uh, designing how your your infrastructure will work on the top of the cloud service. And of course, this is uh, something that is not. Uh, talked about but the providers, the cloud providers, is the budget. Uh, you can uh, easily uh, deploy more machines and more machines and more machines and more resources and more resources, but after the end uh, of the month, uh, of the month, the bill will come and you will just uh, <laughs> go crazy when you see the number. So uh, you have to be very uh, careful with the budget and uh, you need to uh, design properly so you can avoid uh, excessive costs. About uh, Docker containers, uh, well, uh, today uh, Docker is uh, mature enough to be used on, on production uh, environments, but um, I have seen a, a lot of people who, who use Docker containers just to have a, quote, virtual machine, end of quotes, uh, for local development. But uh, we uh, use it a technology based on, on Docker, and it works uh, very well. We will see in, in some moments. OK, uh, having done this uh, brief introduction, I will focus on describing the project itself, OK? Uh, first, I will describe some basic requir requirements. Uh, at the moment uh, when we started to, to build the project, we use it, decided to use Drupal 7, and uh, we will use a multi-site install. We're talking about uh, a platform uh, to which each user on, that, on this platform uh, will have a, uh, a Drupal uh, site for him or for her. Um, so uh, at first, when we started development, we were talking about 30,000 users. That means 30,000 sites. And business wanted to scale, to be able to scale up in the uh, next two years up to 100,000 sites, a lot of sites. They uh, had problems with the previous uh, infrastructure, with the previous version of this uh, project uh, regarding the availability. Uh, sometimes the service became uh, unstable and they wanted to, you know, uh, cloud providers give us uh, almost 100%, uh, so we want 100% availability. Of course, high performance, as always, lowest cost possible, lowest possible cost, as always. And well, the, due to uh, the need to manage so many sites, uh, we need to uh, a tool to uh, control of, of all of these sites. So well, we needed to research an external application. Uh, we wanted also automated and not, not disruptive uh, deployments. I mean, zero downtime when possible, related to the availability uh, percent. And we needed also to do a migration from the previous uh, system. And well, 
one of the problems were that our team uh, was uh, made of only three depths. We have a front-end guide, a guide, a back-end guide, and me as a DevOps. We also have another non-technical people, but well, three people one year, and a lot of sites to <laughs> to the uh, to support and you know all these requirements. So our face was like what? It was like a bit crazy, you know, three people and, and this monster project. But, well, that seems scary, but don't panic, no problem. Uh, we talked about uh, the project, the requirements, and, well, we agreed uh, that we will need uh, a bunch of technologies that uh, could support us in our work, in our uh, mission of giving support to uh, that uh, number of sites. And well, it uh, looked like a great challenge, very challenging task, but hey, we are computer scientists, aren't we? So we started to review the, the possibilities, and well, uh, we focused on, on open source. So definitely, we decided to use, uh, on one hand, cloud computing, and on the other hand, containers, as I described, uh, before we found uh, Apache Mesos is one of the of the tools. Uh, well, I will describe in, in a moment, and well, we will use uh, Docker and all this stuff. I will uh, describe. We will use Amazon Web Services as a cloud provider. Okay, our uh, low-level infrastructure. We will use uh, Apache Mesos. Uh, which is a, a software that let us uh, abstract. It's an abstract layer uh, which uh, let us to just uh, s um, zoom all the resources uh, available on a group of machines. For example, if we had four servers with uh, four CPUs each one, Apache Mesos will, will make us look at these four servers as one server with uh, 16 CPUs, for example, okay? We will use Marathon which is a, a Apache Mesos uh, application which let us run Docker containers on the top of our cluster. And here is Docker. And for the Drupal, Drupal will be the, the, the CMS, of course. We will use Nginx better than, than Apache, Apache. We will use Node.js uh, for the external application to control the, the multi-site to manage it. We will use MongoDB uh, for the field storage, so all the field data and field revision tables will be out of, uh, of MySQL. And to automatize all, we will use Ansible, uh, because Ansible works very well, pretty well with Amazon Web Services with the API. So, uh, well, let's describe. I will go from, uh, if this would be a, a pyramid, I will go from up to bottom, okay? I will start describing the, the Drupal installation and then we, we will go uh, down. So, uh, as I said, we will, we will have uh, Drupal over Nginx and PHP FPM. Uh, Nginx is very flexible uh, when configuring it. That is uh, a two, uh, two sides blade, but well, uh, it gives us a uh, very, well, very flexible configuration. PHP FPM increases performance significantly uh, comparing to mod PHP on, on Apache. And well, we use it mod security uh, just to improve the, the possibility to use, uh, the improve the security of the system and avoid uh, some uh, basic attacks. And well, we developed a, a custom rules for, for Drupal, but well, we, uh, I need to, to work on them uh, a bit before I can release. So uh, like this picture we have, uh, a, do a Drupal Docker container. We, as I said before, used Node.js to develop an application uh, to manage it, the, uh, the sites, the multi-site. So, uh, why? Why so asynchronous? <laughs> Node.js is asynchronous, as you know. Uh, basically, it means you can execute something, you start some execution, and then you forget. You tell the, the application, well, when you finish to execute this, just uh, execute this callback, this function, and you forget about uh, how it works. And, uh, well, 
we uh, manage this with Node.js app, which connected to DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL um, database on Amazon Web Services. We had uh, we have a JavaScript SDK, so we can uh, interact between the Node.js application and, and the DynamoDB uh, table to manage the state of the different uh, sites and, and so. Uh, well, uh, we developed it also uh, on the same app, an API, so we can do a batch processing. For example, hey, there are 2,000 new users to, uh, that want uh, the, their sites created by Monday. Okay, no problem. We just uh, send a JSON to the, our API, and the sites will get uh, created. And, well, we use Kiwis and, and so. Uh, well, now that we have the two main applications, the two main uh, level, uh, the top level applications, we will go one step down, and I will describe the uh, container itself. Okay, remember we have a Drupal running on top of Nginx and PHP FPM. And we want these uh, these uh, technologies, these uh, tools, uh, inside a container, a Docker container. So uh, we need a stateless Drupal container, which is this stateless Drupal container. We don't want to have any uh, mutable uh, data inside the, of the container. We want to be able to kill the container and raise up a, a new container without losing any data. What that this means in practice is that uh, Mencache, uh, MySQL, MongoDB must be external services. And the files, the directory uh, with the user uploaded files, uh, will be out of the container too, so we use it uh, S3, uh, S3 as storage support. For that uh, purpose, well, main cache, uh, MySQL, and MongoDB, you can configure it the endpoint on, on the settings PHP. And uh, to use uh, S3, we use it the S3FS module. It, uh, that module uh, is a great advantage, and I will talk about uh, a pitfall that we found uh, and how to how this module uh, help us to to go on. Okay, the emails will be sent with an external service, which is Postmark, and uh, we use a new relic for monitorization on each container. Uh, you can see here a, a small diagram. Okay, Elastic Ash is uh, blue instead of green because you know. It's not persistent. So having this in mind, remember, we have now the container. And now we have uh, to go another step down. And I will talk about the cluster. As I mentioned before, we use it uh, an Apache Mesos cluster with two masters and uh, a bunch of uh, workers. On the workers, we will uh, launch the Docker containers using Marathon. And uh, all the cluster is orchestrated by Soulkeeper. We also had a high proxy uh, on the bottom. And well, we use it also another tool, uh, another Apache Mesos based tool, which is Kronos, to let us execute Chrome jobs. We had some problems to execute Kronos in the, in the Docker containers itself. So we used it Kronos, and uh, well, it worked very well. Um, <coughs> So and you can see here the, oops, you can see here the, the diagram. We have Soulkeeper orchestrating the two Mesos master, and uh, we had one man worker and then a group of another workers. I will explain uh, now. Very important is that uh, Marathon and Kronos works in a way that they have a REST API exposed. So to launch a new Docker container, a new app. Uh, or maybe a cron job to, to set up a, a new cron job. You just only have to uh, launch a, an HTTP request to that API, and then you have your stuff done. It's very, very good. We will see a, an example later. Okay. So, Drupal on top on Nginx and FPM, on a Docker container, on a Mesos cluster, and Mesos cluster is not elastic, but using Amazon Web Services, a cloud provider. Of the on the bottom of the um, Mesos cluster, we have an elastic Mesos cluster, which is a very, very good idea. So uh, we use it EC2, uh, uh, an, an autoscaling group of, of EC2. Um, and I will explain okay, uh, the, how it worked. 
we have, this is the diagram we have uh, seen before, and take a look at that, at this. We have an autoscaling group with the mesos uh, workers, not the main workers. And well, the root 53, which is the DNS, will point to this autoscaling group. We have all the external services, and MongoDB, we use it, MongoDB MMS, which is the, the management man, managed, uh, system from, from the company of, uh, which created uh, MongoDB. And well, why is this? Uh, we had three different containers, which are first, Varnish, second, the Node.js application, and third, the Drupal containers with Nginx and, and all the stuff. But uh, one of the problems I will describe later uh, implied that uh, when auto, an autoscaling group uh, just scales up, the, it adds, it adds uh, a new EC2 instance, okay? The more, the, more containers are deployed, but when the autoscaling group goes down, uh, if you don't separate, for example, we had only one Varnish container and one Node.js application uh, container, and a lot of uh, Nginx Drupal containers. So if when scaling down, uh, the container with Varnish and Node app uh, it got gets skilled, then we lose uh, uptime. Our application just won't work. So uh, we decided to separate uh, those two, two groups. And well, um, the, when you, uh, when the, when the autoscaling group goes, uh, sorry, when the autoscaling group scales up, um, there's no uh, default way to deploy new containers, so we have to create a script and execute it from etcrc.local to get those uh, new containers uh, deployed after the, the new image is, is up. Okay, uh, let's continue. And well, of course, we have now an idea of how the infrastructure looks, but uh, it's a very large infrastructure to be managed by hand. And remember, a three people team. So uh, I'm a bit lazy with my work. I don't want to repeat work, so uh, let's automatize. Lazy DevOps is best DevOps. Really like the, the way Homer thinks. <laughs> well, uh, we use it Ansible because it's a very lightweight uh, tool. It uses SSH connections to, uh, to manage all the, all the hosts, and it integrates very good with uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, you know, a simple playback, uh, playbook is uh, enough to uh, execute one command and have a full environment deployed. We use it, uh, Docker Hub, a uh, private Docker Hub account, to store the Docker images. When we deployed, uh, we made a new deployment. We just created that Docker image, we uploaded it to uh, Docker Hub, and then we only uh, needed to uh, kill the containers and deploy the new ones. Uh, not in that order, but uh, well, it worked. We use it a uh, uh, rudimentary way to uh, configure the containers itself, which is this, make file and docker file. We use a docker file to um, configure the container, um, the static content of the container. For example, the uh, conf uh, immutable uh, configuration uh, files and the uh, packages installed and so And the make file uh, will uh, help us to deploy mutable content, uh, mutable uh, settings, I mean. For example, the settings uh, PHP file and, uh, and so some configurations about the virtual host and, and so Best point here of using Ansible, and this combination on, of make file and Docker file is that we have a very easy way to create and destroy environments uh, on demand. Okay, but uh, that's not all. Devil is on the details. We have to uh, pay attention to a lot of details as this infrastructure is uh, very complex. So, for example, backups. Uh, Amazon uh, lets you uh, do automatic backups on RDS, for example, 
but uh, well, uh, we created a new recovery plan, uh, a custom recovery plan, so uh, we, uh, we didn't depend on, on the Amazon uh, default stuff. You know, we have a firewall, uh, we just used it. Uh, this is basic, it looks basic, HTTP auto auto authentication for all his APIs, but not everyone does uh, always. <laughs> you will be uh, surprised. Uh, and of course, log centralization. We later, when the project was uh, a couple of months uh, running and working well, uh, well, we, we started using Mesos. Uh, uh, Mesos has inside of each uh, EC2 instance, in this case, in, in inside of each worker, had a, a directory in which, uh, is, which is uh, shared over the network with some uh, little configuration, and we use it that uh, to communicate um, and to store the logs uh, the, of the site creation process. But uh, this is good, but we finish it using uh, Elasticsearch given a um, log stash. But well, uh, Mesos is, is very powerful in, in that point. So I will focus now, I will talk about uh, some problems uh, that we found and solutions and uh, well, databases. You, uh, I want you to think about the problem of having a lot of databases on a multi-site install. You remember a multi-site Drupal install will have one database uh, per site. And if we're talking about more than three uh, sorry, sorry, th uh, 30,000 sites at first, and we want to scale up to up to uh, 100,000 uh, 100, sites, there's a lot of databases. Uh, so, yes, the, the cloud uh, scales, but uh, that's crazy. Remember that MySQL uh, creates one folder per database, and inside that folder, uh, it has, depending on the configuration, of course, one file per table. So, uh, if we use uh, 100,000 uh, folders, okay, it's supposed, uh, supposed uh, we suppose, or we guess, that Amazon will manage that uh, low level stuff, but, uh, well, we test it and uh, it does not, it, 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 it was not working uh, properly. So, well, uh, we just decided to, to make some, some changes. Another uh, pitfall was MongoDB. When you uh, create a new MongoDB database uh, and you add one collection and one item to that collection, uh, it will uh, pre allocate about uh, six. Uh, 100 megabytes, so it's 625 megabytes. That uh, that memory will not be used at this moment, but it's pre-allocated. So uh, if you start creating a lot of database, uh, a lot of collections of the same database, and you start to add in data, that will be uh, growing exponentially. So we have to split uh, because both MySQL and MongoDB. Uh, will not scale up uh, so easily. It was uh, basically unmanageable. So uh, we use a, a strategy, a classic strategy, which is divide and conquer. So what we did, uh, we uh, identified each site using a unique hash, okay? So uh, it, uh, each site with its hash, hash would, that hash will be the prefix for tables on MySQL and MongoDB. MongoDB module, uh, MongoDB uh, field storage that uh, did not have the the prefix uh, the prefix uh, feature, but we modified it. I have pending to contribute that uh, change. And well, what we did, so we can now mix uh, on both MongoDB and MySQL. We can mix the tables on the same database, but we don't want to have one database with a lot of tables, millions of tables virtually. So we used a group by. We grouped uh, both MySQL uh, databases and MongoDB databases on uh, groups of 500 uh, uh, sites. That way we get a maximum size approx uh, of four gigabytes for MongoDB uh, databases and each uh, MySQL uh, database had uh, 62,000 tables, which is more manageable. So it gets more ordered. Um, well, we, 
we only had to, to perform a couple of operations to uh, determine which the database is, uh, to which database belongs uh, which site. So, what happened when we received on the, on the web server uh, a request, an HTTP request? Okay, we used the, the settings PHP file, which is ex executed on all the, the HTTP requests, to perform some uh, changes. So, before creating the databases array, we just detected a, um, um, the subdomain, which uh, is, uh, yes, we use subdomains to separate each, um, each site. So, um, one moment. As I was saying, yes, we received it on the Sydney's PHP uh, the request and we identified the site, the subdomain, the, the subdomain name for the uh, site which received the HTTP request. Uh, from that subdomain, we uh, obtained the hash, the unique hash, and we used that hash uh, as the database prefix on both MySQL and Bo uh, MongoDB. We uh, asked uh, DynamoDB, remember we used DynamoDB to identify which sites are deployed and which are just, uh, just that don't exist. And on DynamoDB, we have a column which uh, identifies the database to which uh, the site belongs. So, uh, we just created on, on that point the, the database SSRI and we can access, Drupal can access so to uh, its tables without seeing the, uh, the other site's uh, tables. And well, to avoid uh, multiple um, database, uh, sorry, uh, DynamoDB calls, we stored the, the database uh, reference on Menkashi on a specific key, so we don't have to uh, call DynamoDB once and once and once. So, uh, we had another problem. This is a very strange problem uh, which happened when we started testing. And when we created a, a new Drupal site, we had a, a timeout, okay, which we could not uh, detect on the first uh, days. It, it happens when the Node.js application just launched a site and uh, well, uh, it just got cut. Uh, we were under very heavy pressure and we just developed a, a, a quick, uh, a quick patch, which basically is uh, take advantage of the Node.js uh, asynchronous uh, uh, feature, and we uh, developed a fire and forget uh, method. You know, uh, we for, we launched the site, we informed a container, uh, a Docker container, hey, create create a new a new site with this subdomain, this user, and and this uh, data, and when the the site gets created, notify me to this new URL. When we, we forget about that site creation process, and when we get notified, we can continue with the processing. After when when the pressures uh, when, when the pressure went down, uh, we uh, could investigate, and the uh, the tangled was produced on Hub Proxy. Well, that kind of things happen, and well, other problems that uh, that we found were. Uh, Unstability on autoscaling group is uh, the kind of, of stuff. Uh, this is related to the, the stuff that I talked about uh, before. You know, uh, the containers being, uh, for Varnish and, and Node, uh, Node.js app being destroyed when the autoscaling group went down. That happened randomly, so we decided to split and have one fixed uh, worker, a Mesos worker. Uh, for those containers and have the autoscaling group with only these, uh, with only the, the Nginx uh, containers. Uh, it was crazy when we were in the middle of migration with in just three days to finish the migration, we were at 20%, I, I think, and uh, this happens. MongoDB instances went out of space. Be careful if you use Mongo, MongoDB MMS system because uh, it creates uh, easy to instances, okay? It creates a replica set on, and a shard uh, of MongoDB instances on, 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 on EC2, but the default uh, storage size, the default volume size are 50 meg uh, gigabytes. And well, uh, we just realized it when it was too late and we lost about uh, three hours 
<laughs> and in, in the middle of immigration, is, it's, uh, it's hard to, <laughs> to fix that. Okay, we, had, we also found on PHP FPN uh, some stability on some requests. And well, uh, just remember to disable slow log when you are using Nginx and PHP FPM. About the S3, uh, we, uh, on, on the first approach, we created one single bucket for uh, each site. You know, 30,000 sites means 30,000 buckets. What's the problem? Amazon only lets you create 100 buckets. That's a big problem. So, uh, as I said, uh, S3FS module saves uh, us, uh, save it us, because it lets you uh, <coughs> configure a single bucket for all the sites, but each site will have a directory on si inside of that bucket, and uh, the directories just don't see in between them. So uh, it was a, a good solution. Uh, you know, when you are applying uh, a new update, for example, we have a new Drupal core release, you have to deploy, okay, the, the Docker container will get uh, the code, okay, we create the image, upload to Docker Hub, and then on the Apache Mesos cluster, we just uh, deploy. But what's the problem? We have to apply a database update to a lot of sites. How to do it? Well, we created a, a, a custom script that will let us uh, call Drush on each of the sites in, uh, using the DynamoDB list that we have for, of all those, all, all those sites. It took about uh, 24 hours 24 hours, uh, a full day, to um, to call Drush on all, all the sites when they were <laughs> 30,000. 30, you know, the, the migration, I, I have spoken about it. We used the migrate module, and well, it was a Drupal to Drupal uh, migration, so no problem with that. One thing to mention here is that, uh, you know, the previous project, the previous version of this project, was a single site Drupal. So you can imagine how big it was. Uh, 30,000 users with a lot of nodes, each one, subdomain module, well, it was crazy. But, well, it went migrated and it worked good. And, well, one comment to add, uh, yeah, when you are using RDS, Relational Database uh, Service on Amazon, uh, if you allocate most, uh, more uh, size for your instances, then the instance can, uh, will have more uh, I.O. Uh, speed. We realized it and we just uh, used it. We had some problems with the, with the database speed. We, we tried first to approach by uh, reducing at, uh, as possible the size of the RDS instances, but well, we realized that it's not a problem of, of storage, you know. Uh, we prefer to have uh, unused storage so it can uh, scale be best uh, as long as new sites are deployed. And also we would take advantage of uh, this, uh, this feature. So, well, I will do a small demo, okay? I have prepared a, a video. And I will show just uh, Apache Mesos. Okay, um, for, so if you don't know uh, it, you will see. This is Apache Mesos uh, HTTP, uh, HTTP console, okay? I have a cluster on my local with two workers, okay? Um, we will see uh, these are the two frameworks, which are Kronos and Marathon. These are the uh, tools on the top of the cluster which let us run cron jobs and run docker containers. At the moment, at this moment, they are not used. And we will see we have two workers, two uh, machines with one CPU each one and, uh, well, two, 244 megabytes of RAM. This is the disk and the IP address. It's very complete. Uh, complete. So, uh, looking at the, at the Mesos main, main screen, we can download. Now, at this moment, we have no task deployed, and this is a, a summary of the number of CPUs we have. Remember, two uh, Mesos workers, but we see two CPUs, and the memory also gets uh, zoomed, and we have them idle. 
we are not using. And active, ta active, active tasks are known at this moment because we don't have, this is marathon, HTTP uh, screen. We have no, um, no application running, no containers running. Okay, this is marathon. And uh, this is just the uh, user interface, but remember that we have a REST API. How the REST API for uh, works? Well, we have to send it to a specific URL. Uh, this file, for example, is a JSON file when, uh, where we describe which, uh, what kind of container do we have. In this case, it's a plain Nginx container. And this is the configuration for the network we have that uh, the container port, which is 80, the default HTTP uh, port, where we receive the, I will stop the video, one sec. Okay. So uh, if we receive a um, request on the cluster port uh, 1088, we will redirect it to the uh, Docker containers 80 port. And well, we have one uh, Docker container in this case, one Nginx container. It will use only half uh, CPU, and we will uh, use 64 uh, megabytes of RAM from the available. There's a lot of options, a lot of configuration. Would you can uh, fix the host where the, the worker, where the, the containers will be deployed, and, and so but well. We have here the, the URL uh, post uh, request. We use uh, JSON and we uh, include the JSON file itself, the, con the contents, and uh, ATXT port um, to the apps uh, URL. So uh, we receive a, a very, a very interesting uh, response. We can uh, even use it to to manage, it. and then you can see. Uh, we have one Docker container uh, using the, the features, the, the resources that we ordered. We have also access to the uh, JSON file we use it, and remember the port open, the uh, number of container, the CPU, well, all the all the data. And now another interesting stuff. Well, you can see here, okay, if you you can access. Well, let's see. You can access to the uh, to the uh, container on a fixed port. In this case, is this one? Okay, we will uh, close it uh, after. Okay, here is the, the nginx. Uh, I I don't think it uh, gets. You know, it's thirty one. Moment, please. Okay, here. Okay, so if we open the uh, fixed port, we have the 31484 port, and we have access to the Nginx. This is a direct uh, direct access access to the Docker container. Okay, but we do not want to access uh, each uh, for, to each uh, different ports each time we receive a request. We want to access through the 1088 uh, port. So we will scale uh, up to two containers. See how easy it is. Just push on scale, set two apps, and we have another Docker container uh, deployed on top of our marathon uh, app. And we have uh, one of them on the 10 and another one on the 11 uh, IPs. We can access on the direct port, okay? But uh, if we change to the 1088 uh, port, we update and we have now access to the Nginx. Uh, as a best practice, we close the, the ports on the range, uh, it's a configurable range, uh, and we let only access to the 1088, so we can manage it on, on a proper way. So this is a marathon. You can see here the resources being used on the, on the Mesos uh, cluster uh, summary, and now you can see here to the tasks which are the Docker containers uh, references. You can also access a sandbox, so you can take a look to uh, standard output, standard error. Okay, so it's very easy to manage the, uh, the containers. Uh, you can see here the access log for Nginx. Okay, so it's very easy to concentrate the logs there. 
that uh, that sandbox uh, will uh, it's based on that shared directory that I mentioned uh, before. And this is Kronos. Okay, this is uh, an example. Uh, we can launch uh, cron jobs. Okay, in this case, it's just a data. Let you. So it's very simple, and it will be executing. This is the next uh, scheduled uh, execution. The time it takes. Well, it's very com. Uh, it's very interested, and that's it. Okay, that's the, the demo. You know, I, I just wanted to show you the the most interesting part on the, on the technology stack that we use it on the project. Uh, just to mention, the the project had has right now, if I don't remember, but about 70 CPUs, uh, 70 cores, and about uh, 120 or maybe more gigabytes of memory available, and almost all of these uh, resources are, are being used. So those are very great numbers. And well, uh, just to, to be finishing, as conclusions, well, this project went live on April, uh, last April. It was a, a success, uh, yes, but uh, I slept uh, too few hours that week when we went live. You, you know how this works. I learned about uh, a lot about the, this, those new technologies, and this is something I, uh, I have uh, in, in very high uh, value for me, and well, the combination of containers and cloud providers is an absolute success too. Uh, just after we launched it, Amazon uh, released a new service which let you uh, run Docker containers on the top uh, of Amazon itself. You know, no need to uh, Apache Mesos, no need to EC2 instance. Well, it was a bit late for us <laughs> to change at that moment. And well, another thing I, I learned, well, I, I already knew it, but uh, Drupal is very flexible. When someone uh, just say, hey, I will use another CMS or another tool, well, uh, this project has demonstrated, at least for me, that Drupal is flexible enough to basically don't uh, use it on every project. Uh, it's uh, very flexible. And well, about this, um, well, about these tools, I recommend you to learn about them. I, but I recommend you not the quick way. Uh, I mean, don't try a couple of hours and so. Read the docs, are very good docs, both Marathon, Mises and so, and uh, keep uh, practicing with them for some time. And well, when you just found the way to reach the volcano and throw the ring, it will be more uh, useful and more satisfying for you. So <laughs> please uh, practice with them. And well, that's all. Thank you. Um, thanks. And if you have any question, yes, please. Sorry? I can't understand. You can. Uh, can you show the site? Here? Ah, the site. No, I don't. Uh, uh, you ask I, if I can show the site. I cannot because I don't have written permission to do so. That's, the, that's because I, don't, uh, I have not mentioned the company. If you remember, I have not seen. But well, I don't have permission, so I can't. <laughs> Sorry. Yes? Yes, so my question was always everybody is very positive. Uh, if you create a new social media site, you will never usually think of the use case that people leave. Uh, so, first of all, obviously, uh, great, great work on scaling at a really amazing levels. Thanks. Uh, but uh, there will be complexities probably when you will remove users and then you had 500 sites per database and then you need to somehow scale. So will that be, how, how, how have you thought about handling that? So your question is? Uh, when, when a user removes moves a site, uh, what will happen? Or is it, is ah, it okay. impossible that you, know, you cannot okay, remove yes, a yes, site? Yes. You are asking how we uh, manage it that uh, sites. Uh, as you remember, we built a Node.js application, which is a custom, a custom application. And we use it, the uh, Amazon API. And well, uh, we connect uh, in that application. We uh, designed it 
to be able to delete, locate a site from the subdomain or from the user identific uh, identificator, the unique uh, ID, and just uh, calculate the database in which is the, the data, the tables, and then remove them or move them to another database and, well, perform uh, whatever action we, we needed. Uh, maybe there were best approaches, but uh, we use this because a custom uh, Node.js uh, app will let us know uh, a lot of flexibility to do these tasks. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? I, ha I have two questions. First, yes. simple one. Did you have any problems with the S3 file system? A problem with? Uh, S3FS. S3FS. Well, at the beginning, yes, because we uh, didn't, uh, we were using the two point, uh, well, the first version of the module, the one point, uh, et cetera. And the, uh, then we had the problem with the, uh, with requiring an S3 bucket for each site. When we realized that that won't be possible, we switched to the dev, uh, to the dev version of the module. Okay, and, and it worked uh, like a charm. No we had no problems with the module in, in this case. Okay. We tried uh, some options, but that worked best. Work. And the other question or idea is, uh, did you think of using this kind of scaling for one site only, using some load balance or something? Could that be applicable? Mm, I think I don't, I didn't understand. Uh, please? You have multiple multi-site installation and, yes. mul and did you think to, um, did you think about using to scale only one domain, one site for, okay. with the same uh, technology okay. you made? Well, I, I did not take the decision on the technologies. I just uh, implemented everything, but the architect was the one who, who decided. But, uh, well, the previous version of the project was a single site, you know, a single multi, uh, a single, sorry, a single site installation. And, well, maybe due to the deci design decisions took uh, on, on the moment or, or whatever, it does not work it fine. It was uh, just slow. We were talking about uh, five seconds per request, per non-catcher non request. Well, uh, the uh, web architect took the decision to use this uh, kind of monster <laughs> infrastructure, and it worked. It was a, a good experience, and well, maybe we we will have consider we we should have considered uh, that option, a single site. But well, at that moment, this this man decided to to use the auto scaling that way. Thank you. No problem. Hi. I Hello. have two questions too. Yes. Um, you said about the main working, the worker and the other workers. Is there any difference between uh, the two? Yes. Uh, what we did to um, uh, get the to avoid the problem with uh, killing uh, an EC2 instance uh, and getting the the varnish and Node.js uh, uh, containers down, we just separate and we have one uh, worker with. Uh, fixed containers, one for varnish and one for the Node.js app, okay? So in the autoscaling group uh, instances, we had only uh, Docker containers with the Drupal itself. That way, uh, the autoscaling group can scale up and down. It can add in instances and kill instances without uh, problems because the, the load balancing uh, occurs inside the, the mesos itself. But we, that way, splitting the, the two kind of workers, we get uh, confident about uh, not being killed uh, on the varnish and, and Node.js uh, side. Okay. Uh, and the other question is simple. Uh, you run DRAS with Ansible or not? Are you asking about running tests? Uh, DRAS, DRUS. Sorry, do DRAS. Ah, DRAS, yes, um, no. Uh, to, to run Drush on all the sites, we build uh, a custom script. Uh, in fact, it's uh, a plain PHP cipher it, and we use it on the uh, over the network. But uh, that was a decision uh, took on the last minute, <laughs> basically. But it worked. We just uh, prepared uh, a launcher, a PHP uh, launcher, and uh, another PHP file which was listening on the container side. 
and well, it just executed the uh, the instruction, the command that we ordered from the uh, other endpoint. It's not best solution. I would uh, have used another another uh, kind of solution, for example, uh, to rise up a new Docker container just specifically to run Drash there, you know. But um, we had no time and we had a, a very heavy pressure at that moment, so we took that uh, approach. And well, it was uh, fixed later to use the, the single Docker container uh, to run the Drash, but well, at that moment, we use that solution. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for your speech. It has been amazing uh, for your Thanks. job. But I have, I have a question. It's running in my head. I don't know if it is a stupid question or not, but I would like to know. How Try to <laughs> with a higher volume, please. <laughs> I would like to know how you make, because uh, you speak a you say you make uh, like 3,000 database, and I would like to know who you make that database. You put all the stuff inside that database, or you just um, separate some tables, or you put all the tables all together. I yes. mean, user, cache, everything all together, or? Yes, you, you're, you're asking about uh, how we manage the, the tables on the database, and if no. we needed to split them in how different. How, how did you separate? All the table. I mean, for example, when you make a, a multi-site database, you can, for example, say to settings PIP, you can say, well, uh, the user, uh, the table user is going to be in that database, and the fields uh, table is going to be in another database. So what did you do? Uh, make it all database, full yes. stack? Yeah? I understand? think I, I get what you, what you think. What we did was two main steps which were we uh, just created the new sites on the database as normal, on the MySQL, on the database that uh, it functions, but uh, we don't have uh, two kinds of tables on that database. For example, cache, cache tables were not on the MySQL database. We use it main cache. Mm -hmm. So we re just removed them except cache, cache form, okay? That has to be persistent. And on the other hand, the field data and field revision tables were on MongoDB. So we just don't have those tables. That way we have a uh, per site about 100 uh, tables on MySQL, okay? And uh, once uh, we did this, we uh, split all the databases. Imagine we had uh, 30,000 sites, so we have a lot of tables, but we mixed uh, tables for each um, 500 sites, I mean each bunch of 500 sites, we create a new database and we start to uh, use that database until, it's, uh, until, until we reach uh, 500 on, on there. And the database, we can uh, be sure that they don't uh, have a conflict because, because each table has a prefix, which is the hash from the subdomain. Uh, what exactly did you do with the user database? For example, if I'm in uh, one site, if I go another site, for example, at subdomain, subdomain uh, I will be keep logging or I have to log no. in again? No, 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 you are logged. Uh, it's a multi-site inst Drupal install, so it, it just behaves. So you manage with the modular? Yes. That's it? It's plain. Okay, thank just you. One more, uh, thank you. Just one more question, okay? And uh, Well, after that, I will be on... Uh, out, but we need to 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 let the the room for the next speaker. Please go to the to the microphone, please. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> My question is uh, on this setup that you had on the on the sites, and it is in a multi-site approach. When you log into one, it, lo it logins to every single site. Mm -hmm. We just you are using like a separate set of users for each one, each one of the, of the sites. Yes, the logging it's uh, separate. I mean, a user logged in on, on a single site uh, will be an anonymous user on another different site. We just had some mechanism to so the admin uh, could uh, interact with the sites, but that's apart. That's uh, not related. Okay, thank you all for coming. If you have, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. If you have more questions or you have to discuss uh, something or whatever, I will be out uh, or maybe uh, down with a coffee. So feel free to, 
to get by me and, and ask thank you.